Who wants some of this? Huh? Who wants some of this? This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, worldwide, sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics. New, new, New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, Your Core Hardcore Fan Page. What is going on, everyone? How are you? Who's excited about today's show? I am. See what's going on. Yes, big Brooklyn show today, Dominic. I know I know all the life agony uh, people are out there. So this is going to be great. What's up, Paul? How you doing? Yo, Isaac. What's up, Isaac? All right. Ah, see, Mina? Isaac's here, right? You brought you brought Isaac around, uh, Mina. <laughs> yes. What's happening in Madrid? My kind of town, Madrid, Spain. Um, what's up, Mario? Everybody. Good to see everybody. Missed everybody. Really have. I hope uh, hope everything's well in your world. I hope everybody's being careful. Everybody's doing what brings them joy. Let's talk a second about a couple of shows coming up. This, this Sunday, we have Mr. Chuck Treese representing Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Chuck Treese is coming on the show this Sunday, January 31st. Of course, he was in McGrad, underdog, bad brains. He was a former pro skater. Then is the after that, a week from today, is the rescheduled Sean Taggart show, artist, agnostic front. Crumb Suckers, Jerky Boys, Cro-Mags, Whiplash, Prong. And then after that, come on now. I'm ready, you're ready, we're ready. Clock, socks, bagels, and locks. Clank your chains and count your change. 100th show with Jamie Jasta. And mark my words, there's going to be a lot of people marching through this 100th show. It's really going to be something special. Thank you all for supporting the show. And then... In the ashes, from the ashes of the 100th show, Gavin Van Vlack will be on the show as well, coming up February 14th. So there you go. Lots of great shows coming up. Um, I'll announce a couple more while we're at it. While we're at it. Edit, edit. Oh, whoa, whoa. Is that right? Did I, hey, Peter Spira, did I just see you in there? Yo, I got to shout out Peter Spire, uh, the, the executive producer of the Michael Alago. Yes, Sean Taggart rules, Isaac. You rule, Isaac. Isaac, you got to come back on the show. Don Foos, what's happening, man? Whoa, they're coming out of the woodwork today. Everybody, good. Good to see everybody. John, yo, this must be a Brooklyn show. John from Candiria, come on now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's cool, man. Hey. Let me tell you about Organic Grill. Organic Grill is a vegan restaurant located in the East Village of New York City at 1, 2, 3 First Avenue. Featured in New York Magazine, The New York Times, and Veg News, their dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on the menu can be made gluten-free for all you gluten-free motherfuckers. This year, they're celebrating their 20th anniversary, and they're all about having a great time while enjoying amazing clean food. After three months of being closed, get in touch with them and order some great food at www.theorganicgrill.com. And while we're at it, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, located, located in Lakewood, Colorado, is the Rocky Mountain headquarters for all things punk, hardcore, and metal. Established in 2014, they have the largest selection of records, CDs, shirts, stickers, patches, and accessories between Chicago and L.A. From the pit to the ditch, they got your back. Get in touch with them at www.chainreactionrecords.com. I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking the same thing. What's up with the hardcore shutterbug? What's up? What's up? Driving that train. Not What's high up? on cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you see Peter from Z Toys is watching today? That's yo, he, that's Peter Spire, bro. He he executive produced the Michael Alago film that I did. 
Wow, I used to see his band at Lamore Far East out in uh, Comac. I know. I saw. I, I I glanced. So many so many comments are coming in. Where is he? Hey, Peter Spire, post up again, will you? <laughs> Where did I, I know? I saw him for a second there. All right. Yeah, Peter Spire. Peter Spire is our dude, man. He he nice. he's yep. What's up, Jamie from SSD Control? Come on now. Um, that said, let's go. Let's do. Let's do photo of the day now. Let's get to it. We're gonna do something a little different for photo of the day today. All right. I want to say this to everybody out there because I've seen this photo here, and we don't want to get we don't want we don't want to get weird here because the this photo is we're not going to do wrong answers today because this particular photo is someone that has passed away and we do not want to disrespect him. So that said, photo of the day, oh. we're keeping in line with the Brooklyn theme. Boom, there you go. Post up if you know who this is. If you know who this is and you have something to say, say it now. This is photo of the day. Um, let's see what we got. Well, the yes. the, there's a hint at the venue right there. Is, is that right? Yeah, you can see it in the picture. Lucky 13? No. No. Let me see. No. no. Oh, let me guess. Let me tell me it's not a uh, Sundance or uh, <laughs> what is that? I, I can't. It looks like Brooklyn. I don't know. What is no, it? Uh, I can see. You know what? It does look like it could be the L, you know, the, the LY, but it's actually the XY from the Roxy Music Hall. Oh, the rock, right. Yeah. Okay, this is kind of funny. Nilo Lugosi, a.k.a. Dracula. Okay. <laughs> All right. Pete Steele, rest in peace. Yo, Jeff and Rage, brother, Staten Island represent. Yes, it is Peter. Yes, it is the yeah. rock, Lori Dawn. Yep. Yes, Rap Owens, it is the Lord of Darkness. <laughs> Adam Sachs, Long Island represent. That's it is it. the Roxy. Yep. Yeah. There you go. December um, 1994. Hold on, let me. You gave me another one, right? Yes, yes. Let's see. Let's see the other one. Here is photo of the day, take two. There, there he we is. Go. There he is with that chain, that chain base strap. Yes, it is. It is Peter Steele. It is black number one. Joe Affy, maximum penalty. Brooklyn represent absolutely. My girlfriend's girlfriend. Yeah. Tell us about it, man. What is this? Uh, this is the Roxy, uh, December 94. Just 94? Uh, 94. December 1994. Yeah. You know, that's about when I did the. That should be that, around the video, right? See that gold record right there? That's my gold. That's my typo negative bloody kisses gold record that I got for producing the. Black number one video. Yep. That and that I think we did that in, in ninety what ninety ninety four, ninety. It's right, it's gotta be right around there because they were just starting to really explode around then. Yep. And uh just you know, there's no one sounded like them, you know, and everyone uh you know, talk about a band that just came up with the sound, you know, especially coming out of Carnivore and completely reinventing himself, you know. But uh I, I remember I, I took a friend of mine who was into more of like the straight up hardcore and it was the first time he saw a typo and, and he said to me, he said, who did you take me to see? He said, they played four songs and played for three hours. <laughs> what did you take me to see the Grateful Dead? <laughs> yeah, but they were so, that? they had that dream. They, no one trudged like they did, you know? You know, we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, Pete and this particular band with our guest today. Uh, is a Brooklyn, it's a real Brooklyn thing. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the video that, that we did back in the day because our guest, our guest was on, was on that. Um, and oh, yes. That's right. That's right. In fact, you know, you know I, 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 will, I will say this. It took me a little while to really appreciate Peace Steel and Typo Negative. The, it took the, me a uh, minute, you know. You, you know what it reminds me of? Actually, I won't even say anything, but... But I learned a lot about the video you're talking about on the walking tour. Yeah, that's right. So right, yeah. My on my walking tour, um, we we talk about 
the Bethesda Fountain in um, Central Park where we shot a lot of that video. And on my tour, I, we stop and I, and I, show, the, I show the camera angle you know, on, on the iPad, right standing right where my walking tour stops. And you see, you know, I, and I do the whole background of it. it, it's, it, is a, it is a pretty, it is a highlight of the tour for sure. Yeah, that was yeah. really cool. Yeah, man. All right, brother. Well, well yeah. done. Yeah, well done, young Jedi. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Looking forward to this one. This is, uh, we've been, we've been uh, hoping to get Mina for a while. So this is great that she's finally here. So I have a good feeling about today. You know, something about these Brooklyn shows. The last time I had a really good feeling is when we had Joe Affey on. So it's yeah, like, that a, was a fun one too. it's very Brooklyn. Some about these, these, these Brooklyn shows, you know, so I'll talk to you in a bit. Well, there you go. You know what this is and you know why we are, are here. And my friends, it is Rambo! Bat Rambo! time. Rambo! 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 I have no idea. What's up? What's up? <laughs> yo, don't, yo, what are you, pinching my style, bro? Well, you know, gotta assimilate. I got the little rat bones. I got the 1998 rat bones, rancid beanie. Assimilate, don't hesitate. I got a big show today, guys. Oh, do you? Rat segment today, guys. I'm glad. I'm glad you have a big show oh, today, brother. I, I want to say I, I can't wait to get back to this. Really, you're in the know. <laughs> you know what these are. I know. I, for those that may not know, the blue, the blue oh, yeah. ticket is a free drink ticket for the A7, and that's what we would give out at the A7. Those, those are free drink tickets, which I'm, I'm sure you hustled from me and didn't use. They were in my pocket. I was like, "Oh man, the good old dude." Guy. I've got a grip of them in the glove compartment of my of my car, so don't worry. I got you covered. I love it. Uh, Todd Hamilton says, "Is that a Rock and Rex shirt?" Yes, okay. it is. West. Rock and Rex, Yonkers. Get out of the go kart. Yeah, I got this. Uh, I think we traded shirt to the oh, A7 man, one time. Cute. I met the guy. He's pretty cool, dude. Yeah, man. All right, what's happening? I got, I got a boatload today, so I'm going to start off with a couple of smalls that I I just like. You know, different shit when I collect. I got these little guys for a dollar each. This little Aussie pin. It can't. It won't let you. There you go. You can Take sit the in the driver's seat, but it's pretty badass. The Aussie shaved his head. I guess that's speak of the devil. Hey, you got yo, yo, you got to quiet your kid down, bro. I'm doing a show here. Come on, I only got a small time here, bud. I, I like, I like, I like that Ozzy has his head shaved. The, yeah, that's uh, speak. I guess uh, speak, speak of the devil. But uh, it's all like '80s pins. I usually grab up this one. Beyond Thunderdome, Mad Max. Oh, come to yellow, come to yellow. And then I like these two. I like this really, uh, this is a 10-year anniversary yellow. Star Wars. But I dig this one because you can see the font on the Star Wars pin, that W. So you can tell that's like probably some original bootleg where they didn't get the uh, the logo right. But pretty cool, pretty cool. And then uh, I showed you guys that truck last time. I like flea marketing because... When you go to one dealer, a lot of times you'll go back and like it's almost like as if he has a whole box in his warehouse of Tonka trucks and he only brings one at a time. So I got that fire truck and then this weekend I got this uh, cool ass cement mixer. Okay, it, that's a Tonka. And it's yeah, it's a Tonka and it's the same Tonka. 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 Yeah, I mean I I see the bigger ones, but it works still. Pretty cool, pretty cool. It works, but uh, I dig that the headlights are still there. The bumper's gone, obviously, right? But yeah, cool. It's all intact. The wind, the glass isn't broken. That's always important. You know, the original paint job's cool. But I like that I always go back to these guys, and they always got the same. You know, it's almost like they got a magic little spot just for me that they go and they pick the stuff back for me. And I gotta slip this one in because I just got this bad boy. I've uh, been eyeing. Sometimes I'll see something in a comic book store and it's like too much money. I don't want to pay that because no. I like the flea market. 
But I've been eyeballing this bad boy up out in Queens where my uh, girl's stepmother lives. And, uh, yo, an X-Wing, I've been eyeing this bad boy up. The guy wanted 75 bucks for it. I've been looking at it for like a year. And I didn't pull the trigger on it. And I went in there and I talked him down to 50 bucks, man. So I would sell this piece for like 120 that's an X-wing fighter. Yeah. Even even I know that. Yes. That's an X-wing yeah, fighter, got, uh, kids. You got the guy who goes with him. Okay. Oh, didn't that dude get? Didn't that dude get wasted in the film? He's like, ah. Well, a few of them. That's like a, a running joke, you know. <laughs> You'll notice in all the in the newer ones, they always have that. And uh, yeah. And I got these bad boys too. A couple of R2D2 and C. Uh, Princess Leia, you know, and the thing about these, they're so yeah, clean, you know. I, I mean, it doesn't teleport us back. You see how clean it is. And that R2 so is so clean. All the way back. You know, a lot of times these are banged up in the paper. It's just a paper sticker on there. So pretty clean R2. And uh, looking forward to the show today. Love Mina, you know. Looking forward, can't wait to hear it and everything. And uh, you know, I'm gonna sit here. I went up to uh, Midtown Comics and I got some uh, okay. some bags and boards for my comics. No, I got them. Like you're on mute. What's that? Bags, bags and boards. I went over to Midtown yeah. Comics. You know, you know why I'm on mute? Why? Because my radiator is clanging away in my pre war New, in my pre war New York City building. That's my it's like gorillas with a sledgehammer. <laughs> How Welcome to New York City. Uh, nice. I missed that. Ping, ping, ping. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, you can't boil. Well, you can't. When you got an HVAC unit, the heat's dry. So you can't, like, put a pot of water on top of the radiator and get the steam going. Bro, I, bro, so, I have bloody. I have, I'm, I have a bloody nose through the whole winter from this friggin' thing, bro. All winter long, I get a bloody nose from this friggin' heat. Listen, bro, the struggle is real, man. I'm living the life, guys. That's all I know. Listen, man. Absolutely. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll check in with you in a bit. All right, guys. See ya. Thank Later. you. Oh, wait. Hold on. Hold on. What you got? Rackbone! 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 All right. So there you go. Keeping it moving and grooving. Uh, everybody behaving themselves. Is everybody ready for our guest? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Bloody, bloody noses, bloody kisses. I I exactly. Yeah, man. Steam radiator, bro. It's like the bane of my existence. Put some pots of hot water on the radiator. Old school. I have a, I have a, a humidifier here, but let's see. You know, Lenny from Crazy Eddie. You're not behaving yourself. Okay. Um, that said, bring her on by popular demand. Let's set it up. Let me clear the deck. What the heck? Here we go. I'm excited. You're excited. We're excited. All these Brooklyn shows just, you know, some about these Brooklyn shows, you know, here we go. Oh, oh. And that said, today's guest, I'm coming for you today. <laughs> today's guest is an American singer-songwriter, Halen, from Brooklyn, New York. She is best known for her work as a solo artist, and of course, over the course of six studio albums with the band Life of Agony. Please welcome, coming at us from Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, the home of Tony Monero, Miss Mina Caputo. Hi. Hi. <laughs> What's up? What's up, Drew? Thanks for coming yeah. on. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. All right. Where, where, where's Rap Bones, man? Is Rap Bones in California? No, Rap Bones is here. He's in. He's on the. He's on the, in in Midtown. He's doing good. Oh, okay. I thought he's I saw right. Rap in like 2007 in California. I wonder if he was there then. And if he's I'm doing... remember the right person, we saw a, a hawk perched. On, on a light, you know, in the parking lot of some Trader Joe's and the hawk just caught some snake or a pigeon and was like literally pulling <laughs> apart 
And I think Rap Bones, and I think we, I was doing a solo record and the band that I was working with, we were all going into Trader Joe's to get our shit for the day or whatever. And that's when I bumped into Rap Bones. I think it was Rap Bones. I wonder if it was, I don't know. If well, we'll, 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 bring him, we'll bring him back on. We'll bring yeah. him back on to say hi in a little bit. But uh, let's 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 get down to brass tacks here. Um, what was happening with you uh, when the zombie apocalypse hit? Uh, how did things change? Did you have shows booked? Like what happened? Um, well, it was March, and I remember the day that the day we were leaving uh, to to tour with Doyle um, was the day that literally they i i guess they put the kibosh on on all touring bands and stuff like that so like i was literally packing i think it was the it might have been the day before or the day of and alan called me up and was just like yo start unpacking and i'm like Oof. what what do you you know what are you fucking talking about? and then blah 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 and then um yeah so I just, so I, you know, I've been in New York. I haven't, haven't left the city. I haven't, um, haven't left my, I mean, I, I leave my home to do my groceries and stuff like that, but I haven't even been to Manhattan to do my, you know, daily, my, my daily, you know, clear my mind bookstore runs, you know what I, I mean? Ha I haven't been to Manhattan in a year, huh? <laughs> Basically, right? Well, no, I, I haven't actually. I haven't gotten on a bus, haven't, um, rode the subway i mean before the whole uh this whole thing um <laughs> my life was one big quarantine anyway you know like i'm married to the music so living isolated and having a, i have a very creative quarantined life as it is so you know um sometimes some of us it, some it, of us love it some of us it's yeah it, it, it's it's I sort of like I sort of like it as well. So I don't love it now because I'm being told by people that I don't respect to stay away from other people that I love. So, you know, there's always that duality, you know, because I I you know, without getting into politics on your show because I know you don't want to dabble into that, but you know, I reject all authority. To me it's all about ethics and and it's like, fuck the rules. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you can't apply all these artificial man-made rules on a, on, a, on a living, breathing creature that's expanding every day, all day long. We're a species that's constantly growing. And um, yeah, but without getting too far into it. Anyway. Hey, didn't, then, you then, have, didn't you have some, um, didn't you have some uh, solo, um, shows booked uh for your uh, anniversary of your of your first solo record was that coming up also um well it already passed now my first solo album was in, in 20 years right almost 20 years yeah and um i was going to do a tour in 2020 in november and then you know now it's rescheduled for 2021 november but I, that's not going to happen either I don't think that's going to happen because it, it doesn't seem like the controllers have any real plan on how to get things running again. There's no real solid structure. There's no real plan. There's just constant arguing about fucking mindless bullshit, you know. Um, but uh, as people are losing their fucking livelihood and shit, you know. But Let's yeah, you know, anyway, I finished my solo record in um, 2020, um, and I am going after my 10,000 hours of classical uh, piano studies. So I've been minimally playing, sitting back down, studying classical um, for like 40 hours a week. So wow. like I'm, I'm keeping, I mean, minimally, like I've been, I, I took discipline and habit and music studies to a, a, a pretty a Hannibal Lecter fucking level. I'm like, I've psychotically reached a new level of discipline 
study. My dog even sits by the piano bench before me now. That's how she's so so trained, you know. It's just like. But did you you have you that that sort of segues into my question is like, how did you come up? Uh, how were you introduced to music? Uh, how did music come into your life? How did music come into my life? Well, I grew up with my grandparents, and I lived with my father's brother. I lived with him in 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 his room. You know um, how back in the day all the Italians used to do it. Everyone used to live together and shit in Brooklyn. Anyway, <laughs> my uncle and fucking. And he, he had like a, you know, a, a thousand, maybe 2,000 vinyls in the room. Oh, wow. I basically grew up pulling Pink Floyd out, John Coltrane, Blondie, Rod Stewart, Miles Davis, Queen, you know, Led Zeppelin, ba ba ba. And then, you know, um, and then um, my uncle at some point, back then in the eighties was like, Hey, I'm going to get mommy and grandpa a piano. If I buy them one, would you be interested in taking lessons? And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah. And then for some reason I picked classical because I, I mean, it makes sense to me now, but back then it, um, and then I took four or five years of classical back in the day until I left home at a very early age because I, you know, we all came up from very abusive homes and shit. So I, I fucked off and I, and I abandoned my music studies, my classical piano studies, my classical dream of, I wanted to actually really go to Juilliard. And then here comes Joey and Alan, fucking SVA kids, ba ba ba, right and shit all over the walls. Hey, you're gonna sing for the punk rock band that we just started. I'm like, no, I'm not, I ain't no singer. I don't wanna fucking sing. I don't wanna be in front of no people. I don't want sweaty fucking bodies. I'm not getting on a stage. I don't know how to fucking sing. I can't do lyrics. I can't, I can't, I can't. And Joey's like, shut the fuck up. You're going to sing. I don't care. And the rest was. Now, Joey, Joey is your cousin, correct? Yes, he is. So there was a family tie there. Yes. And also Joey, I have to say also. So there was my uncle who poisoned me with rock and roll, jazz and, and uh, classical. And then there was Joey and his friends with Alan and their friends. And they poisoned me with the Cro-Mags and the Bad Brains right. and Metallica. And uh, my first vinyl ever, kid you not, I think I was 14 or 15, was fucking sick of it all. Uh, what is it, Clobber in Time? What's, what's the first one? Yeah, the the seven inch or the or the the big one, big vinyl on it. Yeah, yeah, the blood, the blood and the sweat, blood, sweat and tears was my yeah, first. blood, sweat, no tears, blood, blood sweat, sweat, no blood, sweat, no tears. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry, it's been fucking a million years. Lou gets it; he understands the brain. So, yep. um, that was my first vinyl, and then it was Earth AD Misfits, and then I started diving into bad brains and, 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 and diving into that kind of more aggressive, uh, angry outlet. Cause we were very angry children, you know, also you know, as well. How did, um, so you were, so you, so you were kind of recruited to be the singer in this band. Um, I have, of shot that that um alan gave me which i believe is the first show that you guys played <laughs> oh right my god yeah yeah that's yeah actually yeah. that's that's the inside of um what fast lane studios on flatbush avenue in brooklyn new york Flatbush and Flatlands, that was probably like 1990 or 1990, yeah, 1991. What was that, was that Mike? What was that name? Mike, 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 no, Mike. Big Balls, we used to call him. We called him Mikey Big Balls. Because That's not Mike Parente. Mike Parente was Lemoore's, right? Yeah. yeah. Mike Parente was the cat that owned 
they they own Lamar's the Parentes, but yeah, Mike Big Balls, Mikey he Big owned, Balls. That's <laughs> he owned he owned the studio. You know, and the reason if every if anyone's like, what the fuck is she saying? We we coined it. I think I coined it. Oh, term. Mike Ferrara. That's it. Lenny yeah, got Mike it. Ferrara. Mike Ferrara. Called the Mikey Big Balls because he was like the only rocker that we kind of knew of that that openly wore like purple spandex <laughs> in a time in a time when you had people like me scared to shit out, scared to scared to death to be real. And here comes Mikey just coming in with his tennis shorts and we used to laugh. Yeah, because he had pretty big balls, and we were like, "I was oh wondering how you get a how do you get a nickname? Big, like, like did somebody see his balls? Did somebody have his balls in their mouth? Like, how did big how did balls? You know? Because he's wearing the spandex, and you could right. see the, the the package with with everything tightened up. So we we, <laughs> just, we just started calling him Mikey Big Balls, and then it just. It, we ran with it, and he liked it. We all loved it, and that's the that's the name he got for years. And yes, that's a miserable me <laughs> with a dirty doc mom. Yeah, hey, you know, um, you guys like very very swiftly, uh, you know, did some recording and 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 did, and did a bunch of uh, demos. Um, didn't it didn't take you long to? Oh, actually, wait, I have a great picture. Wait, this is I love this picture. This 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 ties in with the piano thing because I was gonna say you know we ha you you guys have to bring this back this bit <laughs> love it it's great I yeah. mean that I was, mean and Joey fucking built that and then Alan and Joey painted the symbol and uh, yeah um, yeah we tried to incorporate the keys you know and yeah. plus. Life of Agony, of course, you know, we were the baby Brooklyn band and we were influenced by Carnivore and Peter and Typo and, and Josh and, and all those cats. And um, hey, since I played keys and I was already kind of like four years into classical, I knew what the fuck I was doing. It wasn't hard to like you know, throw down a couple of synth chords for a couple of parts on a song. So, yeah, we kind of rolled with it, but, but as the years went on, it became much more aggressive. And then, you know, as I grew, I've blossomed and channeled many front people, you know, male, both male and female, and needed to, like, expand and and grow my wings and little old me, angry me, did not want to be, um, you know, fucking boxed up in a little, in a wooden fucking, you know, in a, in a duck box or whatever, <laughs> you know, playing does, a does fucking it, wait, wait, does it still, does it still exist? Does, does that, is that in someone's garage somewhere? The, 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 you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if Alan has it or Joey still has it because those two guys, over the years, like I was telling you, are the memorabilia collectors. Yeah. I'm the one who gives it all away to, to, <laughs> to Alan and Joey because I know they want it, or for Joey's studios, and or you know for uh, friends of mine that grew up with the band, or you know I other 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 than that, it's going to sit in my closet. What's the point? You know, I'd yeah. rather just give away to people who are going to use this stuff. You know. I, I I agree. I, I've I've cast out everything with with a couple of with a couple of exceptions. I don't I don't want these accoutrements in this material life. I just I don't want them. I don't want to drag them around with me. Um, so Thomas Starkey says they came up during the violent era. People swinging hammers in the pit. I mean, Life of Agony. Really, it's true. You guys came up in a very violent era of like. In lack of a better term, let's say New York hardcore or, or, or hard music in New York. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, we we did, and we were part of the violence as well. I definitely was when I wasn't on the stage, um, 
but I think it was just like the signs of the times, you know? I think like, like today, um, listen, I don't think it's any more violent than it is today, to be honest. Like, you know, Life of Agony has to stop their show five or six times before people actually get it that we're not going to continue playing our music. If, you know, because we've been in, we've been in, we've been in venues that have been packed like sardines in a can, like 2000 seaters where, for example, like in Belgium, where there could be this aggressive music playing, but there's complete divine aggressive harmony in the crowd where people aren't utilizing or pushing their ego around, but they're pushing their compassion around and they're pushing their, yes, they're pushing their aggressive self around, but there's a compassion to it. There's a oneness to it and there's a harmony to it that a lot of misguided kids, um, don't really get, uh, you know, um, how harmonious it can actually be, this kind of war dance thing. Um, yeah, but I, you know, I still see kids in the pit that are there just to hurt somebody else. And well, that, there, that, was a, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that back then. And I don't want to mention names, but it was, it was, a. Uh, it was it was a crazy time. Yeah. It was a lot a lot of violence and you know. Yeah, we definitely grew up with a lot of gangs, and um, and if you think about it, it, was for like the stupidest. I mean, not really the stupidest reasons, but no one talked and no one communicated. People got beat up for wearing long hair. Yeah, you know? that's not that's not really hardcore. We we no, you know, and 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 I'll and I'll. And I'll throw myself into that soup bowl mix. Like, you know, we, we were all, we were all, we, you know, look, we were all misguided. We were all yeah. rebellious. We were all thrown away kids. We were all outlaws. We were all outsiders. We were all pushed away and pushed out of society. I'm still running that game. I'm still playing tug of war with the ignorance and the the marginalizations and the fear-based minds that heard the structure of the globe i mean let's get fucking real i'm still like wearing my my rawness and my organic self um um i have no other choice you know um but yeah like let's Let's this talk about all is for kids. you know. As long as people grow and we all learn from those times, I'm sure we, I'm sure we've all learned. Even the worst of the worst have definitely learned from when when we were coming up. When we were coming up, it was it was fucking real raw dog shit, man. It was it was it was fucking on. You know, you didn't have every other little pussy film and every little thing and bop, bop, bar And, you know, it, so it was just people were doing more things to get away with. But now, time, you know, it's a different time. I think now these times, I think the throwaways, the rebels, the people like us, our hearts are, 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 are filled with compassion, wisdom. They're, they're filled with a well-being and a, a healthy being state of mind, at least mine is. And um, yeah. If I may interject, you know, I, I, I've, said this, I've said this, I've said this before that one thing I'm grateful that that's not, that I don't have to deal with anymore is there was that era where everybody was wearing the, the, the basketball Jersey and, and everybody was uh, trying, every, everybody was trying to be hard. And you go out, you'd go out on a night and it's like, it was exhausting. Everybody was trying to be a hard guy one after the, and it was just like, come on already. You know, it was, it, it was like that, you know, mid nineties, every, everybody was like, yeah, was like, oh, God, come on. Meanwhile, here I am 
boom with the most gorgeous fucking lingerie underneath <laughs> my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about let, let, let's talk about this a second um th this record um some will some look upon this as 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 a uh somewhat of a masterpiece um it is produced by josh silver from uh from the keyboard player from from typo negative and uh you know this is really the record that puts you on the map could you talk a little bit about it yeah am i unmuted yeah, I, I'm I'm muting you when I'm talking because there's there's like a weird slapback. So if I mute you when I'm talking, it's just to, to spare our listeners, and then I unmute you like when it's time. All right. So tell yes. let's talk a little bit about this. Well, what do you want to know about it? Uh, Josh produced it, and uh, you know this is the the record that that really kind of put you guys on the map. Yes. Um. Well, I left college for that motherfucker. I was, yeah. I was, uh, wasn't a big deal. I was getting an associate's degree. I mean, I was planning to get a master's, but or a bachelor's, but I wound up leaving. <laughs> I just unoffici unofficially left school. It was like music, rock and roll, or fucking physics, bullshit. You know, all this garbage. I'm never going to apply in my real life. And then I literally just never went back. Um, what else could I say? It was a very, um, it was a challenging record for me. It was my first one vocally. Um, it was nerve wracking. I was very young. I was 18, 19 years old. Oh, wow. That young. Um, I had no interest in fame or being popular. I was, had a very Cobain mentality before Cobain was even a Cobain. Um, what else? Um, I learned a lot on that record. Um, Josh was amazing to work with. He was very nurturing. He was definitely one of the strongest, probably the strongest believers of the band. He believed in all of us. He believed in the magic of the band. Um, Josh also, I believe, had a very wonderful um, kind of a and R mentality um, when a and R people didn't necessarily have an artist, uh, an artist's, you know, usually a and R people are into the art of business and not the business of art and miss wear titles, but Josh definitely yeah, you know, he, he scrambled through a whole bunch of other songs and worked with the band. And we we did a lot of demoing in his attic at his house. Um, we went through a bunch of drummers. Um, and that's how we, we, we landed Sal, too. Um, yeah, what else? Um, I, I, I guess, yeah, I, I guess, you know, I just... It's amazing that Josh does not is not involved in music anymore. He was such an incredibly talented person and doesn't seem like he, he's in the music game anymore. Well, because the music game is total fucking bollocks and it's shit. And it's so fucking manufactured, you know. The music industry isn't interested in enlightening individuals hearts and minds you know the music industry clearly and obviously is interested more in having manufactured artists like cardi b and uh, i mean is there even rock bands in 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 these award ceremonies anymore you don't even you don't even hear about them anymore like to me the music industry it doesn't even represent music and it hasn't in, in a very long time so yeah. not being in the game, he's pretty fucking smart. Yeah, he was a, he was he was incredibly talented. Um, it's a fucking class war now, you know. It's not even about the music anymore or the music industry. It's about who's posting the what artist is posting the coolest photo, you know. What artist has you know. 
the most followers. You know, you have all these rock star artists with 500,000 followers. Meanwhile, when they come to New York City, they're playing the fucking knitting factory. They can't even fill up a fucking hundred seater room in New York City. It's, uh, and, what so are your analytics? What are your so analytics? The fucking music industry has turned into a basically a class war. You got real artists like me that are being buried in the fucking mud that basically and a band like an underrated band like life of agony that's better than any fucking pharmaceutical company better than any fucking therapist and better than any fucking pharmaceutical drug we've spent 30 years writing to uplift the human soul to allow the soul to confront itself to allow the soul to grow to to confront his or her fears people don't do that shit People don't write like that. They don't write like that. Look, 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 you know, look what's going on in the music industry. Look how, look how the, the, the Coca-Cola, the owners, the Coca-Cola owners have seized the music industry and they, they put out all these, this other garbage to just, let's dumb it all fucking down, man. Keep them dumb. Keep them, dish, don't, you know, keep them, uh, so I don't know. I, yeah, there's a little bit of bitterness in me because I, I, you know, it, 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 it's a, it's a whole, it's a big facade from radio to radio DJs to radio programmers. If you ain't paying, you ain't getting played. You, if you ain't well, that's, paying, that's been that way for a long time. Yeah, I know, but it's even more hideous than it ever was. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was a favor. Jerk you off, take one for the team. Buy homeboy a fucking eight ball for the weekend. Now motherfuckers want Harley Davidson's or a new fucking nuclear family in a white picket fence. And if they don't fucking get it, bye bye. You're not getting played. Life of agony, you get played on the radio. Well, we'll put some other band on that sounds like every other fucking band. That's the music industry. That's why Josh fucking left, probably. You know, and that's why Life of Agony. You know, you know, and that's why Life of Agony, you know, is um, it's like a it's like an alleyway cat band. You know, you, yeah. you got to got you got to know the the right alley to go into to suss us out. Otherwise, you're in a fucking right. Zelda. You're in a Zelda game. <clears throat> you know? Yeah, David, David, David Ardnot says uh, talking about the second record, Ugly. This re this record and your voice is what made me want to try to be a singer. Your voice changed my perception of music forever and is still to this day my eternal, unreachable goal of perfection. Any, um, any memories on uh, for the second record, for Ugly? Yeah, terrible memories, to be honest. It was, um, it was, a, lot of, um, it was a lot of pressure from the record label, again, to put out basically River Runs Red Part 2. We got a lot of pushback because we wanted to try and do things differently. We got a lot of pushback because we wanted to try a new producer. Uh, we got a lot of pushback. The band was at an all time um, high of um, being at each other's throats. That's when it really started. We really ugly was the demise of the the the, the band's relationship. Um, basically, I think um, with Sal, um, it, it started back then, and um, and a lot of things, and it was just not. Um, it was a very weird time. And then, this, and this, I, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I don't know if you were asking me something, sorry. Oh no, um, well, I was just sort of segueing into this record, which um, I know soon after, I, I mean, I know uh, Dan, uh, Dan uh, was drumming on this record, uh, Dan Richardson, who from, uh, he was in the Crumb Suckers and, um, Another, another real Lamore band. Pro <laughs> oh, Pro 
Oh, is he in pro pay? Oh, he was in pro pay before that too, right? Yeah. And I know, I know you did this record, and then uh, did you leave before the record uh, came out? I literally no. It was out, and um, I think it was out. Um, but what I do remember was that we were about to blow up on radio, and we were about to become the new ninety-two point three K Rock band. Mm -hmm. Um, that's when, of course, lead singer disease kicked in and, um, I quit the band. I, I just, you know, today, today I watched, um, I watched the, the, the weeds video today and I must say it is a great video and a really great song. Thank you. It's really yeah. great video. Love the video, man. Oh, I was miserable. <laughs> I was. I wanted to already. I wanted to put ten bullets in my head already back then. I was already living way too long as the male energy. Um, for my, I, I was very sad. I was very sad person. I was. I was. I was definitely a dead soul back then. It was a very hard time for me. Um, was it was it odd? That, really, was it well, odd that they was it odd that they they kept going after you left? What was your feeling about that? I was happy for Joey and Alan and Whit. I yeah. love Whitfield. Whit Whit's a great guy. He um, is. We no beef. We never had any beef. Um, we were always very respectful towards each other. I was going through my thing, man. Everyone's got their own story, man. You, you know, you can't be all things to all people at all times. And and by that third record, it was like the people just wanted my soul, man. It was like I, I couldn't deal with the game anymore. I couldn't deal with any of it anymore. And... Um, I couldn't deal with myself anymore. You know, I wanted to fucking die, man. I was doing, I was on, I was hooked on Oxycontins. I was doing cocaine, you know, we were on the ugly tour when we were touring with Corn and Ozzy, man. I was doing mad cocaine with the Corn boys and me and Sal, we were going fucking berserk, man. And I was fucking doing ecstasy and so much drugs. I was hoping I'd fucking OD because I didn't have the courage to, to put a bullet in my head, even though it, it almost got to that point. I really want the drugs to take me out like it took my parents out because I know it's a nice and easy way out. And I didn't want a, my head to be splattered all over the wall. I laugh about it now because I can, and I can, I can even make, I can even see the parody of my own life and um, I'm, I'm okay with everything, you know, um, and my life hasn't become that much easier psychologically, spiritually, or emotionally. I'm, I'm just, just stronger now, you know, and I still wrestle demons and we all do. And, and it's encoded in our DNA as humans, I believe. And we're all struggling. We're all seeking. We're all trying to understand what exactly is going on with, with us as a species, as as a globe individually, when we close the lights and, and, and it's our head only on the pillow. Life's so intense, it's so beautiful, it's so magical, it's fucking bizarre, it's insane, it's crazy. Thank God there's music, you know? And That's and right, creativity. that's right. And, um, I wouldn't be here if, honestly, if, 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 if I didn't have, you know, uh, bringing it back to Soul Search and Sun and Wit and all that in the band. Yeah, like, man, these guys, they're like my true brothers, man, you know. Even Wit, still Wit, today supports me and, you know, sends me social media love and, you know. I, I, I saw, I saw, awesome. I, yeah, I saw, I saw Whitfield sing for Life of Agony and I must say he was very good. He, he, he has a great voice. Um, he really, he, he really, it was different. 
I, but I, it, it was good. He was very, he was very good. I, I got to give it, got to give it up, you know. Yeah. But that's but different is good. It should be different. Yeah, for sure. You know, like if a band does go on with a new singer, it should be different. It should, you know. And if you do want to revisit old songs, it it I'm, I sing my old my own songs <laughs> different every night anyway. I'm right. not a fucking plug in artificial singer. I do what what Plant does. I do what what did what does, and I did what Morrison had done even in this kind of genre for this kind of band i i don't plug in i don't i don't sing the same line twice ever you know um that's not how i roll gotcha. I'm very i'm a very instinctive singer but i'm oh yeah before you go on i have a funny story <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 walking up the block on uh, 52nd Street, what, what's the what's the old uh, the Roseland Ballroom? Um, 52nd Street. Yeah, I was walking up fucking Roseland. I'm tripping on mushrooms. I'm with a bunch <laughs> of. I swear, I swear, we were. I don't know. It's like the oldie blunts shroom days, and I'm. We're walking up the Roseland Ballroom block, and I'm with a bunch of my friends, and I'm like, oh shit. Check it out, bunch of tour buses, ba ba ba. Oh shit, this is the Roseland block. How cool. Oh shit, I wonder who's playing. So we keep moving up. It's like getting modern dark or whatever. I'm looking and buses and I'm trying to see if I notice anyone around. And as me and my boys uh we're passing the back door of the Roseland ballroom, who fucking pops out of the back door of the Roseland? Whitfield Crane. <laughs> and see, this is the universe is just the universe is such a, a web. It's just unbelievable how the universe orchestrates such a, such events in our lives. Like seven billion people on the planet that night, I'm shrooming and I'm <laughs> walking up the block, and here comes fucking Wit, the dude that you know, takes my place and carries on and ba 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 and boom, he pops out. And at this time, Wit had spiked red, blue hair, like kind of look like the COVID thing they're trying to sell, you know, that stupid sell that they're thing. But his hair was, a, and we bumped into each other and we thought it was the most, he grabbed me and I grabbed him. And I was like peeking a little bit, and I'm like, no way, I can't believe it's you. What are you doing? He's like, we're playing, and I'm like, no fucking way, I can't believe this. It was, was, was ugly, was, uh, was, was, was Life of Agony playing, or, 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 um, Ugly Life Kid Joe? Life of Agony. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. How hey, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to uh, give me a minute. Let me shout out some sponsors. Uh, let's take a breather and we're going to come back. Uh, we'll bring you back on. We'll bring on a, a friend of ours as well. Okay. I'll see you in a minute. Mm -hmm. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. And we are sponsored by the Organic Grill, your core hardcore fan page, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards. New York Hardcore Comics, and the Texas Silver Rush. The Texas Silver Rush is a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces as well as to style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers, Greg Rolay, Ringo Starr, and of course, the mighty Agnostic Front. During this current pandemic, all information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram page, and of course, www.texassilverrush.com. Also, lest we forget, Your Core Fan Page. In the wake of the pandemic, Your Core Chris created Your Core Fan Page, utilizing lessons learned from over 20 years of being an educator and social worker. He decided to try and reach where hardcore punk and the surrounding genre of bands create not only their music, but their message. The interviews from a psychological perspective and har to harvest motivation, personal insight and perspective. Please reach out to them on Facebook or Instagram if you have content to share 
or if you want to promote your band, your core hardcore fan page. That said, I want to mention, as if you didn't already know, there is a Patreon page. Please don't be shy. Support this show. This show is, is uh, enabled by your support. Um, check it out. Our Patreon is our community within a community. Uh, there's also a PayPal address there, stone4124 at AOL.com. Yes, support this show. This show supports you. Uh, that said, I want to shout out a couple of my new patrons, Chris Hartnett, Olivis Machir, Meredith Bain, Hedrick Feller, David Funk, get the funk out of my face, Jose Pepe Bayon, One Lesson, Barefoot Mailman, and Manuel Leston. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for supporting me. Appreciate it. Everybody else out there, don't be a lurker. Don't be a Patreon. Join Patreon. Oh, you bought a pillow. Oh, there is a there is a merchandise link down below there. Uh, there's the New York Hardcore Chronicle. There's a New York Hardcore logo um, mug, shower curtain, uh, girls' leggings. There's also the do good things and good things will come to you line of merch. So don't be shy. Uh, you know, buy something, support the show. Don't be a taker. Don't be a taker your whole life. Give a little. Yes, cool stuff. No lurking. Absolutely. Um, what else? What else? Oh, if you're watching the show in a rerun, there is a sub subscribe page there. Please subscribe to uh, the YouTube Stone Films NYC YouTube page. Um, so you get an alert. There's lots of new shows coming up. For instance, where is my where is my show number 102 coming up on January 21st? We've got Joe from Wisdom and Chains coming up. Sunday, February 21st. And after that, after that, we have, wow, already, huh? Okay, this is, yo, I'm announcing this. This is this is a new show announcement. This is, ready for a curveball? Are you ready for a little bit of a curveball? Here we go. Sunday, February 28th. Got a real interesting character coming on the show. Chris D., from the Flesh Eaters, poet, actor, filmmaker, incredible um, film historian, a guy that has wrote numerous books on uh, Japanese uh, samurai cinema. Uh, he also uh, was involved in the mixing of the Misfits uh, classic Walk Among Us, as well as the Germs, What We Do is Secret, he also co-produced the Gun Club, uh, first Gun Club record. So Chris D coming on the show. I'm excited about this. It's a little bit different. Um, looking forward to talking film. I want to talk a little bit of film with another film guy. Just mixing it up, mixing it up a little bit. Yeah, man. When you, when you, when you least expect it, expect it. So Chris D coming up. Um, I've never cried watching your show before today. Damn it, man. I hope you're crying with us and not at us. Um, thank you. Thank you for your emotion and your, and your, and your support. Um, that's it. Yeah. Chris D coming up. Uh, also, also, um, want to remind you if, uh, on Instagram, if you have a communication device on this planet, on Instagram, follow the show at stonefilmsnyc.com. I think that covers everything. Um, here we go, yo. Um, we're gonna we're gonna take we're gonna take some questions later on the show. There is a super chat feature. If you have a burning desire question and you absolutely want to get it through because they come through fast and furious, and you want and it's also a great way to contribute to the show. Throw a couple bucks into the super chat. It's in color. It'll catch my eye. And I guarantee you that question will be asked. 
okay? Um, yeah, there's plenty of Kangos, bro. You want a Kango? I'll give you a Kango. Listen, I'm trying to work. I'm trying to work my way through my my headgear. You know, um, if you have a burning desire, you might need to take a shot for that. There you go. Anyone know where Jason Crackdown is? I think he's in Florida, bro. Uh, that said, let's clear the deck. Let's bring our guest back on. Hold on, hold on. Let's get rid of all this stuff. All this stuff. Here you go. Let's bring on our guest from Life of Agony. It's Mina Caputo. Hi. Hi. So <laughs> let's let, <laughs> let's bring let's bring on let's bring on our friend um, who. Um, you know, I, I, I consider him family. I love him very much, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Alago. What's up? Can you hear me, Alago? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you, sweetheart. <laughs> Where's the beef? Where's That's the beef? That's what I want to know. Where's the beef? <laughs> yes, hi, both of hey. you. Hi. Hey, baby. Yep. Hey, let's talk a little bit, Mina. Let's talk a little bit, Mina, about um, about your first solo record, "Die Laughing." I know um, Alaga was involved in that. S set us up for that. Let's talk about it a little bit. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I you know shortly after I left the band, I believe a year or two later, maybe maybe a year later, I I um. I had all these songs. I wanted to do a solo record, and um, the management I had at the time, I, I fired her, um, and um, hooked up with with Michael. Michael, um, I th me and Michael, we met, I believe, in ninety one or ninety two, and um, I know when Agony was doing um, a bunch of soul searching dates. Um, um, I, I, I've seen Michael a bunch and yeah, we started hanging out and, you know, sharing, um, music and, and authors and, and, uh, poetry and, 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 um, literary and, and philosophical, uh, uh, philosophies like Mike, what I'm trying to get at is, you know, I spent a little time with Michael got to know him more and, um, you know, got to know what, what, what moves this man. And obviously I knew him from his, um, eclectic list of, um, an incredible list of, of bands that he's worked with and has put on the map, like I'll like Metallica and for people who don't know white zombie, um, Nina Simone, Cindy Lapa, you know, he executive produced my album, obviously died laughing and, and um, thanks to Michael, I got the biggest budget I ever got um, to make a record ever in my entire career, still to this day. Um, I won't mention how many thousands of dollars they gave to make the album. Um, but that was incredible because we, and thanks to Michael as well, and uh, both of our, our um, you know, you kind of got to, when you're producing an album and you, you're hiring musicians, you have to, you have to put on your, ba your, 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 your best surgical steel gloves and use your best instruments. And me and Michael butt heads in a great way and see who we could bring in for the right songs. And, you know, Michael, went, you know, went through all my demoed songs and like, you know, I'm, I probably gave them 30, 40 songs to go through and they were chopped down to the best 11 or 12. And then we figured out what artists or musician we could get in there. For example, like, um, for, anyway, we had the producer, Jared Cotler, who was in the band, uh, who did the song, I Smell Sex and Candy. Sex and Candy, Marcy Playground. Anyway, yes. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. That was good. Yeah. He was the bass player from that band who wrote the music for Marcy's, and he basically 
he produced the uh, Die Laughing album and we got in great people depending on the song. We got in Craig Ross who plays with Lenny Kravitz's uh, band, the guy with the big hair. We got Jack Daly who plays bass for Lenny Kravitz. We got Stephen Wolf who's played with the drummer who's played with Miley Cyrus, Elton hmm. John, fucking name it, the list goes on. I don't want to name drop too much, but uh, we have Jerry Leonard, who's a dream of mine to play with. He was basically, uh, he came from uh, uh, Duncan Sheik's and, and um, the whole Natalie Merchant world. And he also landed uh, the gig with David Bowie and became David Bowie's band director. His name is Spooky Ghost. And, or, or Jerry Leonard, that's his name, he's the guitar player for Bowie. And uh, we, we gathered all these incredible fucking people and we made the album Die Laughing. And um, we delivered probably the best album that Roadrunner has ever gotten, ever still to this day, hands fucking down. We delivered them a fucking diamond in the rough that they basically just kind of slept on in America, but in Europe, they right. actually did an incredible job. I moved to Europe. Michael threw me out of the country. I moved to Amsterdam. I toured with the best of the best. Uh, you know, Coldplay at the time was opening up for me. Um, um, I, I played with Travis. I played, I've done so many great shows with Bush, Nine Inch Nails. You know, Neil Young, this one, that one, all these incredible festivals. Um, it was an incredible time for music. Um, it was sad because it never blessed the ears of America, but, um, and, and that's how, and that's pretty much, you know, and, uh, you know, we got, we got all the string players, we string players from Anthony and the Johnson's band. I don't know if you know that artist, Drew. Um, but a lot of incredible people and, um, Michael was there, you know, I was the drug addy, the druggie being bad and being trying to be kept in line. <laughs> and Alago, and Alago was keeping you in line. Is that right? That's, that's all of us in line. And Jared at the time was a little bit of a space cadet. So Michael had to reprimand him all the time as well. We've had some really big errors making that record like we spent thousands of dollars um hiring string section um for four or five of the songs and you know we arranged it we, we recorded it and cost thousands of dollars to make happen and you know jared would lose the hard drive with all the with all the orchestrations and all the strings and but you know that's hey, what happens um, when you make Go ahead. Sorry. Alago, um, yes. give us give us a little perspective on it. How did how did how did uh, what, what's your what's your, what's your angle on this? Well, you know, <clears throat> I already knew Mina for a couple of years, and like she said, we shared lots of music together. We loved a variety of music, and uh, when she says I want to make this solo record, and I said, well, I'm going to executive produce your album, and uh, you know, I always think that uh, when you're making a record, you want to take the audience on a journey. So we had so many songs to pull from that we did, and we, we basically pulled it down to, I don't know, like a dozen songs, so that there was a beginning, a middle, and an end to the record. You know, at some point, we stopped recording at Jared's studio in um, uh, some place in Long Island, and we Great. knew... Great Nick, right. Um, and we knew we wanted to work with the awesome Mike Shipley to mix the album. May he rest in peace. Mike was extraordinary. He worked with the Sex Pistols and Queen and Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And he got like an awesome sound. Now, of course, you know, Roadrunner knew me as Keith in Life of Agony. So they had no idea we were this extraordinary singer-songwriter record that had elements of, you know, I don't know, Elton John and, and John Lennon and Shade Jim Morrison. And, you know, I just, I said, you know, we needed money again. And, you know, I dug in business affairs and I said, Doug, we need another $10,000. Yeah. And he'd look at me and the next- That was Doug, Ke Doug Keo, right? Yes, yeah. he, was, he was lovely. And I have to say that because he gave us lots he, of money. He was lovely, no, he's he, lovely. He was great, Doug was great. 
And so no, we no. started. We went. To, we went to Los Angeles to stay at the Standard Hotel on Sunset Boulevard, and nice. uh, we went to the studio to work with Mike. And uh, the record was really coming along beautifully. We had so much fun in Los Angeles. You know, we we got we rented a, um, a Cadillac convertible, top down. <laughs> And I remember one night we left the stand, we both dropped a hit of E, we got some champagne, and we drove up to the Hollywood Hills where the um, you know the Hollywood sign is, and we started going into these like highfalutin neighborhoods, and all of a sudden security stopped us. I said, Mina, <laughs> put out the joint. What are we gonna do with the champagne bottles? And we put them under the seat, and the dude was so old to begin with. Um, but he said, you know, where we from? We don't know any better. We're from New York. And he said, well, you got to get out of here. So we figured out how to get out of there. And I'm, I don't even remember what happened after that night. We may have just gone back to the hotel and drank and laughed. And, and you know, um, there's a Sufi writer that we both love named Rumi. And so we were constantly opening up in pages of Rumi and like... Oh, feeling the vibe and everything. And uh, the record is an extraordinary album. And it is a brilliant album. Oh, I heard an echo. Um, so, but you know, Roadrunner here just didn't understand it because it was a metal record. People over the years uh, sometimes uh, can't find the record. I think at some point we might re-record the record. And um, if they don't give us back our, our tapes, I'm going to look into getting them back because it's been over 20 years now. Um, but like I said, it's such an extraordinary record. Uh, and, you know, I just, because I knew we were going to wind up talking about the record, that I found our Japanese version of the album cover. Yes. That, yes. that, our, friend, that our friend Edward Maplethorpe uh, shot, uh, the, um, Robert Maplethorpe's younger brother. And yep, we yep. have some beautiful photographs inside of me. Oops, sorry. Oop, sorry. Mina's uh, mom and dad. <laughs> Fabulous, beautiful people. May they rest in peace as well. And then, of course, because we really needed a fold out with, with all the lyrics, and they just wanted us, to, <laughs> they wanted us to have two pages. And that's when I went back for 20 more grand. No lie, 20 grand. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it'd be a little crass if I said how much we really got, but we got over, we got six figures to make this record, <laughs> and yeah. um, you know, we took a little money for ourselves, and uh, we made an extraordinary record. Um, you know, it came out here like this much. You wouldn't even know. It's, see, but, I mean, I mean, uh, let me just say that um, yes, being here in America, uh -huh. it, it wasn't it 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 wasn't even really on my radar screen. They, they it, it I wasn't on a lot of people's, unfortunately. Yeah, they they did really did they really did nothing to promote it in the states. Sadly, because you know, hearing the background of the record, uh, production wise, uh, and, and hearing the record, it's incredible. Oh yeah, yes. well, you know, it came out in Japan, it came out in the Netherlands, it came out in Germany, and it came out this much in the U.S. But you know, we love the record, and both of us are very proud of the record. Uh, and you know, we we kind of talk back and forth if we want to re-record the record do we want to get the masters back and remix the record so it, it's all in the air because you know i'm always moving forward in life and mina is always moving forward in life so you know it just sits there but i think you want to hear the record it's probably available on spotify now is it mina yes yeah perfect there you go great so, so mina you I'm always you proud to talk about it Mina, you moved to uh, Europe for a while. Uh, you were living in Amsterdam. How, how was how was life over there, and and how did that play out? Why'd you come back? I got kicked out. Otherwise, I would have been a happily American refugee, still stuck in Amsterdam. Um, I was over. I was a lot of days over my visa, probably three the four months over my visa and I was going, actually me and Michael were uh, gonna, we would, we put out the poetry book and we were going to do a, a spoken word tour. And then when we, we flew into Germany, the, Ger 2010. the German customs realized that I've been in the, I was in, I was in the, the Netherlands 
90 days over my visa. It was even longer than that. And they didn't even talk to me. They sent me right back out of the country. <laughs> and I had my apartment in Amsterdam, I had, you know, I had a girlfriend there at the time. Uh, I also had an apartment in Queens. Um, um, yeah, but that's not the only, you know, it was great. Amsterdam was incredible. I was a total fucking psycho. You know, I was doing a million drugs. I was having sex with a million prostitutes every time, everywhere, and whatever. Like, I love sex. I'm very pro sex, and um, you know, um, I, I I support working girls. I support the um, that whole community as well. Um, I had a great time. I I felt like I was like living. <laughs> I felt like it was like my living Baudelaire years or my Rimbaud years. Um, in short, it was like the real, it was like, it was like really living, like really poetically and romantically living, you know, um, taking major risks with drugs and, and prostitutes and that very gritty lifestyle and being in a rock and roll band, man. If I, if there's an epitome of fucking rock and roll, a rock and roll cliche, it's it's been me, sadly. But um, not sadly, because I'm 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 happy and proud, and I don't regret anything or anything that I've been through or I put myself through. So like I, I learned th from it all. I can laugh at it all. I was fucking wild. I I gave wild child a new fucking name, and. Um, it was great. It was a great time. I, I, I miss it. I know Amsterdam's not the same as it used to be um, because now you're not even allowed in a coffee shop if you're not a, not even a Dutch citizen. So um, things huh. have changed wow. radically. Yeah. Um, I didn't know You that. know, you're not allowed to buy weed unless you have a, a Dutch citizen with you or something. All these crazy, stupid fucking rules now. Um, but yeah, yeah, you know not the only country I lived in in Europe. I've lived in Sweden. I've lived in Berlin. I've lived in, um, I've lived in Cologne, Germany. I, I've lived um, in Belgium. I've lived in the south of Holland in Maastricht. Um, so I, I, I'm a fucking, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a Roma. I'm definitely a hunt, you know, I'm still like hunter gatherer. <laughs> I got a question uh, from uh, from Sander. It says, Mina, is that the time you collaborated with the Dutch band Within Temptation? It was one of the times, yes. Guess what I found. Oh. It was one of the times, yes, because I probably spent a good 11, 12 years on and off in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. But I've lived in different cities in the Netherlands. I've lived in Amsterdam. I've lived in Alkmaar. I've lived in... Um, in Den Haag, I've lived in 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 in, in um, Demon. There's so many in there's so many different cities. Like just like in there's Brooklyn, Bronx, Jersey, Long Island. You know, I was all over in the Netherlands. And one of those times, yes, I was actually to answer that person's question. I was living in a little town called Kotzovel. If they're Dutch, they know what it is, mm -hmm. and it's where Efteling is, where it's like a great adventure in the Netherlands and um, it's like an elf kind of thing. Perfect for me because I'm kind of elfy. Um, I'm elfish. I'm elfish. That's where, I got, that's where I got the call from the Within Temptation crew. I got the call from Rob um, telling me that they wanted to collaborate with two singers and one of them is dead. And that was Kurt Cobain and I was the other one. And, and when he told me that, I was like, you know what, motherfucker, I'm in. I don't need to hear anything else. So, and then it turned, and then and boom, it was like a major hit. I mean, the fucking songs like over twenty quadrillion trillion whatever, and um, that 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 was a, a, a. They're a great band too. They treated me very well throughout the years. I love Within Temptation. They're very, you know, they're very, very very sweet, very compassionate human beings. And, Let me ask um, you. Let me ask you, in, in 2003, um, you did those LOA reunion shows in, um, at Irving Plaza. How, how did that come about? Did that, and, and I know after that, 
you sort of got back into the life of agony uh, groove. Um, memories of, of those reunion shows, and, and why did you go back and do them? I mean, you know, why would you go back? Why would you? Uh, you, go you want me to answer it? You want me to answer it? I, me personally, I'd go back because um, I miss I miss the people in the band. I miss performing the music, and and I fucking love New York City. So put it all together, and and there you go. That that's pretty much you know I I miss I miss the band. I miss rocking out. I missed um, you know it's it's a. Uh, this lifestyle is a very, um, a very double-edged sword. You know, it's a very love-hate relationship thing. You know, it's like how do you? <laughs> you know, it's like you know this person has like an STD, right? <laughs> but or or has AIDS or something. But you're like, I don't give a fuck. I'll die for this person and you'll go in anyway. And that's kind of like, I know that's an extreme metaphor. Oh, just a bit. It's like, you go <laughs> into it, knowing, you go into it knowing like, it's not an easy lifestyle. It's not, it's not designed for, for it's not designed for the working bee. You know, you really need to, <clears throat> You really need to have a grip on, on, on manifesting and how one creates their own reality to be in a lifestyle like this, because it's very tumultuous. If you're, you know, most people are chasing security and safety. This is the furthest thing from it. This band stuff that the industry and even more now, but yeah. That's why you go back. It's like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like a love hate thing in a way, you know, um, not in between, not with the people, but just everything that comes along with it. It's, it's hard. It's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not easy. Otherwise everyone would be doing it. You know, it's, it's not for the faint of, it's not for the faint of heart, as we say, very emotionally taxing. It's spirit. It's spiritually degrading. Um, I don't know if you, if you're in someone who's into a healthy lifestyle or like for me, like I have a very indigenous diet. I like to call it. I eat very plain. I steam all my foods, 99% plant-based. It's very steamed. I can't get any of the food that I eat here at home anywhere in Europe. I can't even find a bowl of steamed organic fucking broccoli in Europe. And that's what I live on. I live on bananas, broccoli, uh, you know, non-GMO breads, non-GMO foods. Like I literally live on bananas and brown bread and avocado when I when I go out on the road when I'm in Europe. And I'm I'm not saying I'm not complaining, but of course, like when the, when the clubs are making dinners, they can specialize at dinner. I get a nice warm meal once in a while, but for the most part, it's like bananas, bread, and water to get me through it because it's fucking hideous. The food, you know, the the lifestyle. The <laughs> it's what I eat. It's what I eat here: bananas, avocado. <laughs> That's pretty much my New York diet. Yeah. I mean, I'm gonna jump yeah. in. I'm gonna jump in here for a minute because I'm gonna jump out in a minute. Ralph Renner, nice to see you too. Uh, Brian Whittemore, uh, Upstate Rick, Joanna, my big kiss girl, Ivan G, and uh, where's that Mike Mooney? Mike Mooney and Joe Ackerman. You know who I am, Joe Ackerman. Anyway, I'm going to do my Instagram live show now. But thank you both for having me here. I love you both so we much. We love you. Yes, I love you both so much. I'm grateful that I got here just to chat about died laughing. And so funny, this fell out of one of my uh, one of my books. Wait, can you see, wait, 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 wait? Can you see it? Yeah. I don't know. It's Irving yeah. Plaza, but I don't know what year. Yeah, it's I have no idea. Probably. But um, thank you for having me, Mina. I'll talk to you later because I'm home. All right. All night. I'll see you. Uh, thank you very much. 
Uh, and uh, hey, we, hey, we and have that call. We have that call on Friday, right? Yes, we do. One o'clock. All right. Uh, I'll see you in a bit. Maybe you want to tell the people, Drew, about who the fuck is that guy? The fabulous journey of Michael Alago. Oh wait, wait. Because I'm here and there's lots of people here, I gotta be shameless just for a minute. Go ahead. So, now all y'all, you know, there's a movie out with Drew, and we've been on Netflix for three years. Uh, a contract expired. Drew will explain what's happening in the future. But this is my messed up book. But I have a book out called Ooh Ooh. Oh, I am Michael Alago, breathing music, signing Metallica, beating death. 20 bucks on Amazon. Put a shekel in my pocket, please, and buy the book. Okay. All right, we love you, Michael. We'll talk to you Bye. soon. I love all of you. Thank you. Have a good night. Cheers. Woo. Uh, I, the dynamo. I love it. The dynamo. He's hey, let, let's, um, let me ask you about, uh, we're skipping around a little bit. Um, we're going to take some questions, but I mean, are you are you happy right now with the state of the band and who's in the band? And tell us a little bit about Life of Agony today. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very um, it's a very loving situation, you know. It's very it's very loving, you know. It's very compassionate. It's a very gentle experience. If um, if you understand that there's a lot of, there's a lot of compassion. There's a lot of gentleness. There's a lot of truth in our situation. Now, no one's walking around on eggshells. No one's, you know, there's no competition within the walls of expression. It's just a very free flowing, natural, no one's attached to nothing. No one gives a fuck about anything, you know, um, it's just very, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're always talking, you know, me and Alan or me and Joey or me and V, me and Veronica, sending texts and dirty texts and, you know, stupid, you know, Wolf of Wall Street gifs to make each other laugh. And we've already begun writing a new record. Um, we just did the Sound of Scars, which is, you know, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, you, you you broke up a little bit, but I I can hear you now. Yeah, it was going out a little bit, but um. I don't know what you got or what you didn't get. Um, well, the gist of it was that you're very happy these days with the band and yeah, it's, it's who's in the cool. band. Yeah. It's very cool. It's very relaxed. You know, there's, there's no, there's no competition in the walls of our expression. You know, it's very free flowing. We're very detached by what we write, you know, um, very open, very flowing, lots of good communication. There's great balance, you know, there's two boys, there's a genetic female, there's a, there's a, there's a I don't even know how to even describe myself anymore. There's a <laughs> both and a neither, there's a both and a neither, you know. Um, so the frequency, the energy, and the vibration of the band is very creative. It's very open. And, you know, we're just, you know, we're just uh, as carrying on, just we just want to write the greatest rock, hard rock songs we possibly can, you know. And um, we've already started writing. We're shooting around some ideas, you know, and we're all waiting around. We're all trying to figure out, like, you know, we're waiting. What's the fucking plan with all these people? You know, and we, you know, there's nothing, we're all at a standstill. So we're writing, but there's really no rush. No one, we have tours booked and shows booked for 2021, but I'll be honest with all music fans and lovers, I don't really think anything's fucking happening. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we had Australia booked for March. That shit ain't happening. 
No. No fucking way. And um, June, you know, festival stuff. I have a solo tour in November. I feel even embarrassed trying to sell the dates. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's like ridiculous. It's like, I, I don't know. So no one knows what the fuck's going on. Hey, Life of Agony just made a puzzle. Go buy a puzzle. Yeah, Go, I, I saw oh, that. I saw you, I saw you, I saw the puzzle. <laughs> It was actually pretty cool. But, uh, <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking, well, that's an interesting image for a puzzle. <laughs> As if fucking life isn't puzzling enough. Go fucking right. go go get the life of any puzzling puzzle since since life isn't puzzling <laughs> enough, people. Hey, before we um before we take some questions, I want to ask you about um about the moans, your solo album. I, I the latest one. I listened to it uh, all the way through this morning. I loved it. It it didn't stress me out. You know, a lot of music stresses me out now. Like, you know, so it, it's very rare for me to be able to listen to something that that I can enjoy and and walk away and, and in my apartment and and you know not not because I listen to a lot of aggressive music and it it, it takes me over, you know. And th this was this was this was really nice. I love um, summer in the wolf's bean. Summer in wolf's bean, yeah. Yeah. It's that was my favorite. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, I really. Uh, I'm happy you enjoy it. That means I lot. did. I, I really, I really loved it. And um, tell me, uh, what, one name that came up is—is is it Andy Kravitz? Andy Kravitz. He's my. He's my. He's my partner. Yeah. T t tell tell us about your collaboration with him and and how he came into the picture. Fucking awesome history with Andy Kravitz. Andy Kravitz is like my danger mouse now. He's like my my Danielle Lenoir, you know, or, um, you know, like Radiohead's Nigel Godrich. He's like my producer that I always want to work with. And he's a Grammy award-winning producer. He has an incredible studio out in Malibu. He, he's a vintage gear collector. He, he's really a drummer. He, he came up in the hip hop world in the Fuji days. He's, he's done records with the Fugees, with Wyclef, with Warren Hill. He's, worked with Bismarck Key, he's worked with Elton John, Billy Joel, you know, you fucking name it, the guy has put his mark on their album, either sonically, he, he produced Joan Osborne's, remember that song, what if God was one of us, that motherfucker. Yeah, of course, what if God was one of, of course. He won shit for that, like he was, a, he goes way back and how I met Andy was incredible because we, when Life of Agony did the Soul Search and Sun record with the with the with the Niccolo brothers, right. um, who the Butcher brothers, I should say. I mm -hmm. hope I'm getting it all right. It's been such a long time. Andy had a place called the Amazing Barn, and this was all in Pennsylvania or Philadelphia, wherever it was, in the middle of the woods, nowhere. And when we wanted to get special guitar sounds, or like if I wanted to lay down Mellotron on mm -hmm. one of the songs or a special like kind of Beatles instrument to get that whole Beatles feel in the album and shit, like with the keys and stuff. We went to Andy's place to track because he had this, it literally was an amazing fucking huge barn. It was in a state. The place looked like some fucking um, gorgeous, just wooded out area. Like uh, uh, it would look like, your go away upstate home fireplace big room vintage paul mccartney microphones he has he has david bowie space odyssey outboard gear in his neve 73 he's got he's got the wish you were here uh um pink floyd outboard gear um in his in his in his neve now like the guy's an incredible collector he plays drums for me he mixes everything for me I write and record everything here at home in Brooklyn. I record all my shit. I write everything. And then when when I've personally exhausted my musical and uh, limitations as far as instrumentations and piano, guitars, and the bass, and everything that I'm playing and programming drums, I send everything to him. He dumps everything into his old vintage, his two-inch, his knees. So... We, you're hearing very analog, 
Yeah. Things are done digitally, but we finish everything off analog and we treat everything with that whole vintage, like, you know, a proper fucking, it ain't no Happy Meal fucking McDonald's record. It's a fucking true proper, you know, steak Wellington fucking broccoli and potatoes kind of project in a sense, you know. And Andy, we, I first met Andy all the way back in those Soul Searching Sundays because Andy did alternative versions of Life of Agony. Andy, Life of Agony recorded Led Zeppelin's Tangerine. And Andy, record, we recorded that at the Amazing Barn. Ba, 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 ba. That's how I met that motherfucker. And I don't know, I, I've been working with him now since 2012 is the first solo record that I took to him, which was as much truth as one can bear. I did that in 2012. And I think, I don't know, um, I don't know how many solo albums I've done already, but 12. I must have done four or five with him already. Um, so, but I love him. I love, and then, <laughs> and then what I did with Andy was absolutely meticulous and gorgeous. And then I brought it to Joey because Joey now has a mastering lab. Called yeah, the I, saw and I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. Gorgeous, up to date, state of the art fucking mastering gear. I sent it to him. He took my record sonically from here to fucking here. And I'm like, oh my God, like, yeah, I love you, Electric Ladyland Studio, but I right. need to pay $3,000 a day for the same gear that we got at home now. And, yep. you know, Joey, Joey, Joey did an incredible job. And um, I will right. be, yeah, I'll be taking all my, my unmastered version albums to Joey now in the future because he, he just really fucking did my record justice. And um, that's the Let practice. Me, got it. Let me uh, do a final uh, uh, shout out to a couple sponsors and uh, let's take a break. We'll, we'll come back and we'll take some questions, okay? Before you do, shout out to Isaac and all his heads and all my boys and all my pipe hitting motherfuckers. <laughs> keeping John Joseph, keeping it real politically and fucking health wise and uh, hoya chimed in too before everyone who came in dominic guy alago danny fucking who else came johnny from candiria everyone yeah all the heads. oh oh joe Affy, all you brooklyn people don foos from fucking wherever That's, he's at now i love he's in Cle no don's in cleveland i think right i know yeah wherever he's from uh, so yep. everyone Thank you for stopping by. I love you. Um, and um, many blessings and wishing and, and just unconditional love and blessings to you all. I love you. We'll be back in a minute. That's happening. That's right. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. We are sponsored by the Organic Grill, Chain Reaction, Records and Skateboards, the Texas Silver Rush, Your Core Hardcore Fan Page, and, of course, our favorite, New York Hardcore Comics. New York Hardcore Comics opened back in 2013 when lifelong friends Debo to Pro and Lee Fairley combined their, combined their collections and obsessions for comic books, punk rock, toys, and statues, Magic the Gathering, and all things horror. The store is located at 117 Main Street in Dobbs Ferry, New York. If you want to support them during this pandemic, please contact them by email at newyorkhardcorecomics at gmail.com. That said, I want to mention another new show coming up um coming up so you better get this party started wednesday february 10th we are going to have the big a7 back to the new york hardcore roots music series compilation uh the rest of the bands are going to be revealed we're going to have a bunch of special guests but this is going to be the big banger 17 bands we're going to bring a bunch of them on here. Uh, after this, it's all going to be out there. That's the A7, big A7 compilation coming up, designed by John Buskey, uh, Jonathan Buskey, and a lot more. So this is going to be a great show. We're going to march a lot of people through this show. A lot of the great New York bands will be coming through on this one. So that's Wednesday, February 10th. Please tune in to that. Uh, that said... Uh, just a reminder, 
is if you didn't already know, there is a Patreon page and a PayPal page. Please support this show. This show survives on your support. Absolutely 100%. Uh, also join, uh, get, get with the Instagram. So that said, yeah. Hey, Joanna, I hope you're well. Thanks for tuning in. What's happening in Denmark, Steve? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. Uh, a show of Candiria. Well, we kind of did one already, bro. Go back to YouTube. Look through the archives. Uh, we had John from Candiria uh, as a guest on the show pretty early on. Yo, Alan Robert, what's up? You got any questions for Mina? <laughs> That's pretty funny. Hold on, Mina. I'm bringing you back in a second. Some of your bandmates are chiming in. Uh, that said, it is it is uh, it is question time, my friends. If you have a question for Mina, please post it. Um, if you really have a burning desire, uh, there is a uh, super chat you could do for a couple bucks. That helps. Let me clear the deck. Um, let me get rid of everything here. Wah, wah, wah. Here we go. All right. Questions? Uh, Chucky Brown, whatever you got. Um, here you go, Mina. Uh, Mina, first question from Alan Robert. Uh, question for Mina. How's Tony? Love you. <laughs> Tony, great, Al. I love you, Al. I miss you. Um, Alan's writing some fucking, Alan and Joey are writing some great, great fucking songs right now. Great riff and a lot of great riffing going on right now. So thank you for that, Al. It's been getting me through. I'll be in song two soon. So um, Tony's great. Um, pain in the ass sometimes, but uh, that's because she loves mommy and wants to be my shadow all day long. But everything's great. I feel great. I'm in great spirits. Um, yes, you know when I've sunk low. <laughs> Al knows. Al always. Al's always coming in like, "Are you okay? You haven't been showing your naked body on Twitter yet." Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you haven't. Yeah. We haven't. Se we haven't <laughs> seen. We haven't seen any any feet photos. Any yeah. photos of your feet for a couple days. We're getting worried. Yeah, what's going on? You haven't uh, put your feet in my face. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question. Here's a question from our resident historian Chucky Brown. Uh, back in 2008, she had 35 different album titles and picked a fondness for hometown scars. Was that title inspired by a William S. Burroughs book? Absolutely was. Yes. Absolutely was. Absolutely was. And how does this person know I had like 60 fucking running titles or something? Well, I'll tell you, um, we do our homework on the show. We have people that are very passionate about the show, and, and we're really fortunate for that. I thought I was being left in the fucking gutter as some artist. I thought I keep calling myself like the Van Gogh of rock, <laughs> you know, because like, you know how like a lot of fans let a lot of their favorite living artists die while they're alive? And you know, like when someone someone's favorite artist dies and suddenly the whole world loves them again. Meanwhile, they were alive for the past 20 years. Where the fuck have you been? You know? Um, okay. Oh, wow. oh, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, I had about, I had, because I'm psychotic, I had like 50 or 60 times. <laughs> I could never make up my mind, it's true. Mm. And I believe I let my friend Corinne Hardy pick the title who wound up doing the artwork and the layout. And Corinne Hardy is, is the director of now The Nun. Remember The Nun movie? He's well, my friend Corinne, who I've known since the early 90s. He did this gorgeous claymation with his hands. Took him seven years. You should get him on your show, actually. He's incredible. He does the show gangs of gangs of london now he did the nun he did this gorgeous film the butterfly and mm. he used to do my artwork oh, oh and he did a pulling video 
for a hometown uh, for a fondness for hometown scars. And I couldn't make up my fucking mind. So I was like, I sent Corinne the list and I'm like, Corinne, you pick the fucking title. And he wound up picking the one I, I borrowed from Burroughs because I'm a big William S. Burroughs fan. And I'm a, you know, I'm kind of bohemian in a way. And I'm kind still, of, I don't want to say I'm a beaten. Yeah, but I'm kind of like from that whole Soho beatnik. I'm like, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm a little, I've got a little Bukowski, Patti Smith attitude in me, kind of, you know. Go ahead. Here's Sorry, a, I talked. Here's, it's, it's, it's okay. I, it's okay. I'm starting, I'm so, I've, I've adjusted to the ebb and the flow here. I, I've, 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 I've got it. Um, here's a, here's a question from, uh, uh, Chitmang, Mina, are you ever going to write a book? The Amsterdam stories alone sound incredible. Um, I believe I will. Um, people have been asking me that question for the past 20 years already. So I think I definitely want to do kind of like my storybook, like a biography or whatever. But I want it to be. I want it to be very untraditional. I had a book deal. I had a writer. We spent a couple of years on the book. Um, the, the publishing company, the writer and I weren't seeing eye to eye at all. So that whole deal fell through. Um, so that whole idea was pretty much abandoned. But this was when the time when Laverne Cox got the Time magazine. So this was years ago already. Um, but if I do it, I, I will do it, but it's going to be very untraditional. It's going to be a very botched. It's going to be all over the place. It's not going to be this, you know, properly edited fucking it's going to be botched. There's going to be words crossed <laughs> out. It's going to be, you know, jumping, you know, there'll be an Amsterdam chapter. There'll be a, an abuse chapter. There'll be a drug abuse chapter. There'll be sex abuse chapter. There'll be just so much shit. There'll be life of agony chapter. There'll be fucking, you know, um, escorting chapter, of course, because my life is very, um, even now, it's very, um, I'm single my whole life, so I don't live, you know, I don't have a white picket fence and a lawn. I don't have that kind of lifestyle. I'm single, I'm raw, I'm wild, I'm feral, you know, I'm pro-sex, I'm pro-nature, pro I love people, um, and I love to connect physically, sexually, spiritually, you know, I'm very creative, playful human being. And um, I don't even know why I was telling you this. My mind is just—it was okay. That, 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 you know, I, I like where I like where that went. I, I, um, I like it. Um, is there? Here's a, a question that's, from Dale. That's, is that's how if, I would make my book very free, mm -hmm. very botched? You know, very kind of just botched. We're not going to the grave. Like we're the only idiots that dress the dead. You know what I mean? It's like. Who wants to go to the grave fucking immaculate, you know? I want to go botched up. I want to go with all these different experiences in my body, all these different things that gave me love, that gave me hate, that gave me power, that took my power away. I want to just, I just want to go to the grave all fucking like just fucked up, you know? Because we're going to yeah. decode anyway, you know? So Gina B, yeah. Gina B asks, Gina B asks us, uh, Mina, how long have you been vegan? I'm not vegan. I, I, I'm not vegan and I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily call myself vegetarian. I call, I pers I call what I do. I call, I have been, I call my, I just call it an indigenous diet. I eat steamed vegetables. I eat tons of fruit and, and all, and, 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 foods that are high in antioxidants, which are just all fruits and vegetables pretty much. And um, I don't do dairy. I don't do sugar. I don't do white sugar. I don't do brown sugar. Um, I go through my phases with coffee 
Um, I don't really, the only white fish I really eat is shrimp. So I call it indigenous diet because when you study to become a shaman or the way the shamans eat, they eat white fish and they eat plantains and that's all they eat. And before you, before you do something ceremonial, like, you know, we go into the jungle and you do these ayahuasca ceremonies or you do these peyote ceremonies or whatever, you got to cleanse the system in order for the plant medicine to work properly. And, and I just take a lot of what the shamans do in the jungle and how they treat their body. I apply it to this modern day street life. And so I have an, I have a rule basically, if it doesn't grow, don't eat it. Um, do Fair I, che do I cheat once in a while? Yes. Um, if I'm going to go to an Italian restaurant or I visit my Italian family and there's, there's a, there's a big bowl of, 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 uh, spaghetti with fra diavolo, which is spicy shrimp and or a lobster, of course, I'm, I'm going to go in and, and I'm going to enjoy, but meat is, is not on my diet regular, regularly at all, unless I'm testing something for my dog, because my dog also eats organic and, and she eats very, she eats raw and she also, she eats probably better than 70% of the planet. Um, I got a question. Yeah, I call it an indigenous diet. I'm, I'm not, I don't wear that vegan or vegetarian title because if my body feels like it needs a piece of meat, like I'll give it to my body, you know, and that's, I listen to my body and okay. usually I average maybe three to five steaks a year, if that. Okay, I have a question from David Ardnett Jr. I was at your birthday show 10 years ago at the Dominion. It was an absolutely amazing, beautiful, intimate experience. Will you ever do another show like that? I'm always down for you and cake. I remember that Dominion show. It was very beautiful. I, I spent half the night at the piano and I, I reorganized all my songs um, and um, very stripped down version of stuff. It was very intense. And I do stuff like that all the time in Europe where there's really my core audience in America. I, maybe just New York City alone, I can do that. Um, and, I, and I will, but no one's doing anything right now. So, yeah. and to be quite honest, I am not into the whole fucking cyborg thing, the way the whole music industry is turning all cyborg and everyone's live streaming. And, you know, I'll get at the piano and I'll play live for a couple of hours. I'm not like, you know, I know this is how bands are trying to make money and shit, but I, I think it's the fucking most hideous fucking, it, it defeats what music is all about. And that's bringing people together. And here we are. I got to sit in my fucking bathroom and play now? No. Hey, I want to um, I want to bring on a couple of as we head down the home stretch. I want to bring down. I want to bring up a couple a uh, couple of my people. First off, uh, you asked before. Hey, Stephen, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Good. Hey, Mina, you asked about Stephen before. Stephen uh, took a bunch of great photos of you, uh, including this one. Stephen, you got anything for Mina? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That was an amazing show, by the way. That was the Life of Agony, Sick of It All show in Huntington, which was uh, which was amazing. Just a, oh, yeah, can't can't beat a double bill like that. But um, I do have one thing. It's funny because Mina and I have met over the years a ton of times, and and uh, always uh, I got to speak to you at Michael's uh, film premiere, and I told you then. I'm going to tell you again now. You have a song called Mother on your Heart's Blood album, which is just a tremendous, like, John Lennon-esque, just a masterpiece of a song. And it's really, it's really just resonates today, like in the last few years. Um, I, I, I would love to see something happen with that song. I, I wish more people heard it. I think it's just uh, an incredible, incredible song. Thank you. I appreciate that. It, it is a very intense song, and it's, 
it's funny you bring up Lenin because indirectly but indirectly related lyrically um, actually that song was inspired by Marvin Gaye and you know the whole title I mean you know with Marvin mother mother you know there's too many of us crying. So I kind of like, I, I, I could get choked up thinking about it now because of like just the climate of the world, you know? And it's like, so yeah, that that whole, that's where it came from. I, I <laughs> that inspiration, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a very emotional creature and that's what, that's what makes me me, I guess, but that's that's really that the Marvin Gaye, but Lennon's a big inspiration for me as well. But I I kind of just ripped off everything Marvin Gaye was just trying to say and just kind of in my whitewashed little world of what I go through as a human being. I had to like I had to put something out like that, and I hope that the world appreciates the bulk and the impact and the uh, the depth of my work before I actually leave the planet because it would be really a blessing for me to experience global what these songs can do to the globe like the way they would touch you like you bringing random shit up like that to me is emotional Wow, uh, it's 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 funny because I, that song is on a regular like that's a regular regular rotation song to me, and uh, much like the the died laughing, which I also hear a lot of uh, the band. I, I hear a little bit of jellyfish in some of your stuff on the died laughing record. Were you a fan at all? I am, but I I, I don't I'm not a fan to play old and stare out. So, but um, I am aware, of, but that definitely wasn't, you know, um, I'm just very, you know, I have a very Woody Guthrie, Dylan, Dylan-esque, Emmy Lou Harris kind of, you know, Bob Dylan kind of writing style. And I just like to put the right people around me, you know, and get different and just get different results like on that hometown scars album brought up before like tracks but when when flea played trumpet on it it took it to this whole other fucking gorgeous um kind of uh blue and green um Energy. I don't know if you know the the song "Blue and Green" by Miles Davis, but um, yeah. Anyway, sorry I got emotional. I, I yeah, cause I I get emotional cause I live like mostly. I make all this music, and I and I sometimes feel like all this beautiful music just gets brushed under the fucking rug because of where everyone is at these days, but it's nice to know that people are still listening and it's touching. So thank you. I appreciate that. Steven, uh, thank, yes. Steven. thank you. And, and Mina, thank you again. And, and thank God willing, we'll see you very soon on stage. Yes. Thank you, darling. Get home, thank get you. home safe, Stephen. I'll talk to you soon. I definitely will. Okay. Hey, Mina, somebody else wants he to say hi. Sorry. Yeah. I <laughs> you up. Somebody he else wants to say hi. Hey, Rap Bones, what's up? Mina, what's up? How are you? Oh. Yeah, what's up? Hi, I, I how heard, are you? I, I heard you telling the story about when we ran into each other in California that before it drew, and it was, uh, it was actually, it was two hawks fighting in a death grip is what was going on. And they were plunging, and right when they got to the break of the parking lot, they split across each other. And as the one went that way, I looked over, and there was some dude standing over there, and I was like, hey. 
And you were like, oh, shit, rap <laughs> we were like in the middle of California, ran over to each other. It was pretty cool. And uh, I got to say, your spirit's so intense that it's just really nice to hear someone speak about, like, freedom and strength and, like, getting out of our dark places. I mean, we all joked back in the day, and everybody pokes fun, and, you know, you know, oh, the guy with the troll hair, we used to say, and that drum riser, like, we didn't know what that was almost. And it was so different, and I got to say this, because I, I have all this stuff going in my head while we're watching the show. I think if there was like a trifecta, the New York hardcore trifecta would be like AF, sick of it all, right? And Chrome Ad. And then the Brooklyn version of that is like LOA, biohazard, and typo negative. It's like a you gotta it's like you gotta have those together, you know? So uh, the music was powerful and I think even though, you know, you were like a pre Marilyn Manson attitude of like how to cope and deal and it looked negative to people that didn't understand what we were all about. And uh, I think it's really cool that you, you have touched a lot of kids that might have been in the dark place, heard your lyrics, and then it kind of like the same way metal connects us all or hardcore connects us all. It's like you see the other kid that looks like you with the same band stuff going on. You're like, oh, I, I'm not really alone in this, you know? So same thing with the drugs. I identified so much with a lot of you. You know, we're wild child. We're we're like all the members of Motley Crue in one person, guys. Like, <laughs> nuts, you know. But we're not. We're the sweetest people at the end of the day. We care, and we're very emotional. But hardcore, we got to put up that tough image. But you know, you really broke it down nice, man. It's good seeing you. Yeah, I, I feel like everybody that I mean, when when we all came up and you guys came up before me, because I was very, very I was like probably one of the, I was one of the babies in in that, that whole era and it's just really refreshing to see how many of us turned out to be empowered souls in a way and is you know and 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 we're busy living and busy uplifting people and trying to change not trying to change people's minds but just give them different perspectives because you know yeah we know how it how it feels to try and live to make other people comfortable you know i did that my whole fucking life and half my life <laughs> disappeared but like it's just it's just amazing to see you how you turned out and drew it is true i thought maybe oh man am i having like a bad mushroom fucking flashback did i really meet rap Phones in the fucking parking lot and see hawks so right behind my house. It right looks so amazing. Like you know, everyone, man, everyone that's just, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it just brings me a lot of peace and happiness to see so many people just holding it down, keeping their families together, no matter what we went through. And we had a fucking raw dog. A, we came from a very rough hideous just brutal fucking time man like the kids of today would not survive what we've been through at all none of them. i don't care who who you get on what new jack kid you get on the show these kids have no idea i mean yes the world is ah, but this is politics and politics always makes the world even more creepier because yeah i mean nothing's changed since reagan things just get crazier and crazier and worse and worse. It's just this crazy game. And then, and then the globe gets even crazier. It's just, I don't know. It just, it feels good to see so many people that I know doing so great with their head straight on and um, living their lives, man. And, and just, and being honest with themselves and being honest with other people and just finally just, you know, believing, you know, and, and realizing it's like ecosystem, not ego system. Even in our own, even in our own chemistry, our own biology of what it means to be ourselves, what it means to be human, what it means to be a, a, a good person on the fucking planet, man. You know, it's just, I don't know. Fucking awesome. Man, hey, rap that, that was Sorry. Hey, there's nothing wrong with being a nice guy, you know? No. 
Take it from Rat Bones. Hey, thanks, bro. Um, hey. Rat Bones, I'll see you. I'll see you uh, soon. Yep. Next time, guys. Great Thank show. Later. Yeah, Rat. Well, that was nice, huh? Um, <laughs> Drew, I'm not as crazy as I thought. <laughs> hey, um, look, you were right. Yeah. Hey, I want to thank you so much. Um, it was an honor to have you on the show. Um, on, do you want to, do you want to shout anybody out or, or on the, you know, Just anybody you want to say hi to or bye to? Um, I said hi to everyone and bye to everyone. And I don't know who's that, but whoever is, um, stay up, stay strong, stay creative, turn the television off, you know, um, Get out in the sun, spend time in nature, eat as healthy as you possibly can. Now's the time to abandon your filthy habits. If you're a cigarette smoker, if you want to quit drinking, this is the time to do it. This is the time Mother Nature is getting us, is bringing us closer to ourselves. I know it seems like an insane crisis and stuff, but personally, I believe all is in divine order. All is divine love and divine harmony. I can see through the madness. Um, I hope that you can too. And um, don't buy into every little fear pill they're selling trust your instincts and um, be as good as you possibly can be. That's how you create your now, you know, focus on your breath, get into meditation, you know, sit down, get a, get into a quiet spot, quiet your body down every day. It's very important. Get out, take a walk, breathe the air, get into the sun and, um, yeah, that's all. I, you know, I don't know what else to say except thank you to you. Thank you to everyone who's listening. Thank you to everyone who, 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 who understands and appreciates what I do creatively. Who understands and appreciates what what Life of Agony has been doing for all these years for for the people. And um, I just wish people mad love. Mad strength. Um, <laughs> put your fucking warrior badges on. Um, yeah, and see, <laughs> even if you wear dresses, it doesn't mean you're a pussy. <laughs> hey, I love you. I'll talk to I you soon. You. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You, you, my friend. You have been watching the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. And our guest today was Mina Caputo for Life of Agony. It was a great show. I hope you enjoyed it half as much as I did. Um, I kept pretty quiet on today's show. <laughs> I kept pretty quiet. You know, there was a little bit of a weird um, sort of echo and uh, lag. So, you know, just kind of gave Mina the ball and let her run with it, right? It was a great show. Um, you know, where did I see Jojo? Um, hold on. Uh, where did I see Joe Ackerman? What's up, bro? How's Tallahassee? Um, Hey, Jojo, did I see that you were talking to, um, to, oh, you've been talking to Josh from typo negative Jojo. If you're talking to Josh, please tell him, I know we were never, we were never pals back in the day. But I'd love to have him on the show if he was if he's up for it. I really would. I'd love to talk to Josh about his days in typo negative and you know his days uh, these days being EMT here in New York City. I'd be thrilled to have him on the show. So please uh, convey that message uh, to him. Thank you, Pepe. Um, listen, the show's great. The show's great because you people are behind it and you support it, and I mean that. I'm not being corny. Um, I do a lot of work on these shows, um, and it means a lot 
that it, it comes through uh, in the shows. I, I don't, I don't just wake up and do these shows. I spend a lot of hours setting it up, um, and and it's your support that enables me to do that. I'm very fortunate that I'm doing something that I, I really love doing. So you know, so thank you, um, thank you, D. It, it was a great show. Um, what else? Um, and thank you, Gina. I mean, thank you so much. Um, don't make me cry. <laughs> I don't want to cry like Mina. <laughs> well, I know it's okay if you cry, but I don't really want to cry right now. But but I will say, I will. I know. Thank you. You know, it's interesting because doing this show was not part of the master plan. It just happened when the zombie apocalypse hit. Um, you know, I. And now I'm doing something that I really love doing. So, you know, sometimes in this life, you never know. One door closes, another one, another one, another one opens. Um, so there you go. Uh, just a reminder that um, on Sunday, uh, this Sunday's Chuck Treese. A week from today is Sean Taggart. Um, then, of course, we have the big 100th show with Jamie Jasta. It's going to be a banger. I'm going to march a lot of people through that show. And then, of course, we have Gavin from Ab Absolution. Um, that said, Steen in Denmark, you've always been such a great supporter of mine. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> oh, after show 100, I'll upgrade to the next Patreon <laughs> tier. Uh, listen, I'm just glad you're a part of it, my friend. You know, I I'm, just, I'm just glad you're a part of it, and I mean that. Um, yeah. So do I got everybody? Uh, Dominic, you know, all the Life of Agony people that chimed in today that watched the show, Dominic, um, you know, Johanna, um, you know, Al, Alan stopped by, you know, all the great Life of Agony people. Thank you so much. Uh, Cody, absolutely, man. You, you, can, you, can, count, you can count on me. Um, <laughs> you do good things, Drew. The family will follow. Well, well thanks. Um, I think, yep. LOA cruel. Yo, LOA merch girl. What's up? <laughs> yeah. LOA has some great people that work for them. So, you know, that's fantastic. I want, I want to thank, I want to thank the people that make the show happen. Chucky Brown, uh, Steven Messina, the hardcore Shutterbug, Sid, the kid. Uh, we had some laughs, you know, on that last show, we caught him napping on us. And of course, rap bones. Yeah, it's been great. Um, what else? I will. Larry Kelly, my friend up there in Massachusetts. I'll say to my, I'll say hi to my dad for you. Uh, Olivia, this show, this has lifted my spirit. Thank you, Drew and Mina. Well, it's really great. It lift, it lifts in my spirits too, and it's just really awesome to have, you know, people that are so passionate about their art and have them come on. And, and, and I always, I always feel, I like to think, I like to think that my, my history, you know, with, in this business and my history working with these people enables me to have a certain amount of accessibility. Cause in a lot, a lot of ways, um, it's about accessibility with, with, with a lot of these people. And I, I have a belief that all the work I've done in, in my former life, as a um, as a musician and as a tour manager and with the music videos and with films like the Michael Lago film um, have just put me in a position that people are willing to come on the show and 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 talk to us because what makes this show great is it's a community effort. Other people have shows, but they're not live. They do not have the community that we have. That is really what makes this show great, is the community. And people come on here, and it's not just a static interview show, is that we take questions and, and there's interaction, and people love it. And I'm blown away by the people that, that um, watch the show and that reach out. And if you're watching the show, you can always reach out. I'm here. I love to hear from you. Um, it is Dale. Thank you. It is our bloodline. Um, and I will continue to do it. It seems like, it seems like I'm going to be doing it for a while. Um, 
you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, hold on. Hold on, hold on. And although sometimes I get really, really tired of, of doing, of having to run the show myself, because it, it, it's, it's a bit exhausting to me. David says, I'm trapped in seclusion. This was the closest I've had to being at a show with my brothers and sisters, with talking, laughing, loving. This is our scene. Live and well. Well, live and well. Well, thank you, man. It is. It is, it is. Um, I like how you keep... I like how you keep the assholes out. Good vibe. Honestly, man, I don't have the patience for it. I don't care. Um, if somebody wants to talk out the side of their neck, they're not welcome here. Uh, that sh this show has established that. Um, if somebody wants to be stupid, they could just hit the road. Um, we don't have time for that. You know? Um, so, you know, that, that, that said... I am keeping the new, the heart of New York hardcore. But, you know, we all are. There's a lot of people that are out there doing it, but you know, we, we we've got a we got our finger on the pulse here. Nick Black Sabbath. I haven't heard from you in a minute, bro. It's great to see the show still running on all cylinders. I know you haven't been around for a while, bro. Uh, I'm not always able to make everyone. Life gets in the way. But what matters and what counts, Nick, is that you were here in the beginning and you stop by every now and then, and that means the world to me. It really does. Um, Dominic, listen, thank you so much, bro. <laughs> you and the whole LOA crew. Um, <laughs> yes, Sid the Kid is now sponsored by my pillow. <laughs> don't worry, we're gonna get Sid the Kid on Sunday. <laughs> we're gonna that was really, that was really, really funny. The Sid the Kid. Yeah, we gotta do the Sid the Kid roast. That was really, really funny. <laughs> oh boy. Woo! Uh, top three show. Please have her on again. Absolutely. There's certain people, there's certain great shows that we've done that we have to have the people back. We have to have John Joseph show, John Joseph, uh, Mike Judge, Danny Diablo is always welcome back on this show. Um, there's been some great ones. You know, we're going to, there's going to be a whole round two, you know, with everybody. In the meantime, you know, we're, 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 we're marching, we're marching ahead. Um, so, you know, uh, Bobby Hamble, we've talked about Bobby Hamble. I don't even think owns a computer, you know, and like I've said many times, like I've said many times, we gravitate to the people who, who know about the show and who watch the show. I was really, I was really, um, humbled when Igor from Sepultura said, you know, he watches the show all the time. When I started to talk to him about the setup of the show, he's like, yo, I know I watch the show all the time. You don't need to tell me. I know the format of the show. That was heavy, man. That, 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 that was, yeah. Ezek episode number three is going to happen. Absolutely. Uh, Billy bio. I know he's overdue Billy for, for a second show. Yep. Yep. Billy bio is, is absolutely overdue is, is absolutely overdue. So that said, um, I want to thank you all. Uh, today was a great show. Absolutely was. And uh, I will see you on Sunday with, uh, with uh, Chuck, uh, Chuck Treese from McRad. Uh, until then, do good things. And good things will come to you.